Good morning. My name is Nicola Latimer and I'm going to be presenting the role of task representation in academic reading into writing. So for most students, academic usually, writing usually begins with an assignment and they have to read their assignment brief and decide what it is they need to do, what, they're, what they need to produce in response to that um, assignment brief, a task representation. And this presentation is going to briefly report on some of the findings of an eye tracking study uh, on an academic reading into writing task. Examine the role that task representation played in shaping the reading processes of the participants and consider what this means for how we teach and assess academic writing. So Wolfersberger defines task representation um, in the following way. It says, when confronted with any academic writing task, the first thing a student must do is create an understanding of what skills, products and processes the task requires and make a plan of action that will lead to a written product that appropriately fills the writing task. So here it seems Wolfersberger is not just talking about the skills and the competencies, competences that students have, but also the way they're going to apply those skills, how they're going to use those skills, um, and what that finished product needs to look like. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about my motivations um, for this study. At the time, I was working in the Language Centre supporting students with their academic skills, primarily students with um, English as an L2, but not exclusively. And the first um, time many students seemed to, to come to seek help was when they got that first written assignment, usually around November time if they were starting in uh, late September. The undergraduates often seem to be ill-equipped for academic study, particularly in terms of their reading skills. Um, they often didn't have a clear idea um, about how they were expected to um, read strategically or, or um, selectively for academic study. And um, often th that, that difference, trying to differentiate who fell into the L1 or L2 category was really um, often irrelevant and unhelpful. Uh, it seemed to me that um, many of the students uh, were suffering with the same problems regarding, regardless of their first language. And so the research questions uh, which I decided upon for this study uh, were three altogether. First, what are the characteristics of reading during an academic reading into writing task? What type of reading were students engaging in in order to complete an academic reading into writing task? What were the similarities and differences between the way first year undergraduates and say third years or postgraduates um, tackled the task. So really, uh, what was the role of experience um, in, in performing an academic reading into writing task? And thirdly, what uh, similarities and differences were there between the way high scoring and low scoring participants tackled the task? And so um, I designed my research um, as follows. Um, I used an academic reading into writing task that um, was designed for students to tackle in about 60 minutes. Um, it was one that we were using um, as part of a, a, a diagnostic uh, test for academic reading at the time. And the task required students to identify um, a problem that was uh, in that was mentioned in two sources, two academic sources uh, of about 600 words uh, in total, summarise the solutions and um, give their preferred solution with a justification. And um, they were asked to write an answer of about 250 words. Um, I asked, my participants were 15 uh, first year undergraduates and 15 third years or postgraduates. Um, they were all a mixture of native and non-native um, speakers, but all of them um, 
I judge to be uh, at the C1 level and interest is, and statistically there was no significant difference between the scores um, on the task between the native and the non-native speakers. I used eye tracking uh, to track their reading. I used stimulated recall after um, they'd completed their task to um, ask them to tell me about uh, their thoughts as they proceeded through the task and I used a cognitive processing questionnaire um, uh, that they completed after the event. Um, the source texts were rated, uh, the sentences, the individual sentences of the source texts were rated for relevance by three expert raters. And um, all of the, uh, the answers that the participants produce were uh, double marked based on content, organisation and language. And just very briefly, this slide gives you an idea of um, what it looked like when the participants were uh, completing the task. So they had a computer um, monitor in front of them. Um, the eye tracker was um, positioned at the bottom. I sat um, out of sight, usually ju actually just to the side of them, um, and uh, checked, the, monitored the equipment um, as they completed the task. And this is what the participants screen looked like without the red lines. Um, I've used the red lines to try and uh, define the different areas for you. So on the screen, effectively, they had some uh, general instructions about um, how to move between pages at the top of the screen. Um, the source that they needed to read, the sources, the academic sources were uh, in this area here. Um, and they were spread over um, five pages. So the first source um, was on page two and three, and the second source was on page four and five. And um, both of the sources had um, some graphic information, um, and the graphic information appeared on page two and page four. And page one had um, the task inst uh, instructions, if you like, the assignment brief was on um, page one and students could move from page to page as as many times as they like simply by clicking on the triangle that related to the page they wanted to read and um, on the right hand side of the page they were able to compose their answer and obviously every time they they changed the page that they were reading this area on the right hand side didn't change at all and I decided to use two frameworks to um, help me uh, analyze and process the data um, that I was collecting. The first was uh, Chan's cognitive processes in reading into writing. Um, and I decided to integrate that. Um, uh, Chan's high level reading, um, which you can see highlighted there in a, a slightly different color, um, mentions the, ty the different types of reading um, and those are taken from um, Khalifa and Weir's model of reading. And effectively, Khalifa and Weir divided, uh, subdivided reading into careful reading and expeditious reading. So careful reading, proceeding um, uh, sequentially through the text to build a, a full understanding of the main um, ideas or expeditious reading. So that's included things like um, scanning, searching, skimming. We just wanted to tell you a little bit um, about eye movements in uh, reading. Um, eye tracking has been used um, as a tool, key tool to help us understand um, much of what is known now about um, how we read. And reading is actually broken into fixations and saccades. So rather than our eyes sliding smoothly along um, the line of the text, in fact, we stop a fixation, we pause, look at a word, and then we jump very quickly um, to uh, the next um, fixation. And that's called a saccade. That jump is called a saccade. Um, and in adult reading, these fixations, these pauses usually last about a quarter of a second and on average occur about every eight characters in careful reading. Um, and the saccades um, usually uh, are very, very quick. 
about uh, just 40 milliseconds um, to execute a saccade. Not all of the fixations go, we don't go relentlessly forward through the text, about 15%, and it does vary depending on how complex the text is, um, about 15% of fixations move back to earlier parts of the text, um, and these are called regressions. And um, I just wanted to show you um, a, a very small extract um, from an eye tracking recording. So you can see here the red dots represent the fixations and the line shows the saccade, the jump. And you can see participant clicking on the triangle, moving page um, uh, to and starting to read um, one of the source texts. So you can see what the sort of data um, that I collected um, looked like. And in order to analyze my data, I developed an algorithm which looked at uh, different metrics uh, from the fixation data um, and classified um, series of fixations into either careful reading or selective reading. So it looked at a series of metrics um, uh, and classified um, and you can see the metrics here described underneath, in, underneath careful reading um, and identified patterns of fixations which met those, um, those metrics and classified that as careful reading and then um, classified fi fixation patterns which didn't meet those um, metrics as uh, selective reading. So before we look at the results, I just wanted to give you a quick recap on the research questions and uh, the methods. Um, and measures. So um, I had three research questing, questions. The first one was what type of reading did they, did they engage in? Um, the second was what was the role of experience? What were the differences between the, the way the task was tackled by less experienced and more experienced participants? And thirdly, what were the difference um, in the way the task was tackled by the five highest scoring and the five lowest scoring participants? So I had um, those three types of data, had the stimulated recall data, the eye tracking data and the cognitive processing questionnaire. And within the eye tracking data, I was interested in where they fixated, uh, which parts of the screen um, they looked at, um, how that those fixations were um, distributed in terms of the relevance of the different sources, the sentences of the source text, and um, thirdly and finally, what type of reading they engaged in? Uh, was it careful or expeditious um, reading? Careful or selective reading that students engaged in on the task? Okay, so we're going to um, have a very quick look at um, the broad findings for research question one. So first of all, where they looked on the screen, we can see that they spent about 6% of their fixations were dedicated to the task instructions. Um, they spent uh, about 40% of their time, uh, their fixations were devoted to looking at the source text. Um, almost half the time, 47% of the time, they spent looking um, at their own work, reading uh, what they'd written, and about 7% of uh, their eyes were elsewhere. So that might have been looking at the screen instructions or um, uh, closing their eyes or looking away from the screen. The stimulated uh, recall and questionnaire data suggested that participants adopted strategies to help them to decide what to include. And for some participants, their understanding of the task continued to change and develop as they work. In terms of um, sentence relevance, um, we can see that there was a, a, a moderate correlation between sentence relevance and attention. Um, but sometimes the stimulated recall also suggested, also suggested that sometimes um, students spent more time on sentences that they didn't understand, rather than necessarily just focusing on those that were most important. Um, but the analysis of the um, fixation patterns from uh, revealed that 71% um, of fixations um, were classified as selective reading and actually only 29% of, of the fixations um, formed patterns which suggested that careful reading 
um, was taking place. So a, a careful systematic pursuit of the text. So for research uh, question two, the differences um, between the less experienced and more experienced participants, and um, we can start to um, compare the overall results with the results when we divide them into two categories. So we can see that actually there was very little difference in terms of the amount of time they spent looking at the, um, at, at the assignment brief, the task instructions, and um, their own work. There were some small differences. Um, but really in terms of um, the amount of time that they spent um, looking at more relevant or less relevant sentences, there was uh, really no, no difference, no discernible difference between the two there. Um, we started to see some difference in terms of um, the amount of careful reading and the amount of expeditious um, or selective reading with um, the more experienced student uh, participants engaging in a greater amount of expeditious or, or selective reading. So when we look at the role of experience in terms of patterns of reading, um, the more experienced students made twice as many references to reading um, for GIST as their less experienced counterparts and they made these types of comments, which suggests that um, they were more conscious of the decisions that they were making. They were more purposeful in their approach to reading, um, perhaps, than their, than their less experienced counterparts. The other difference that emerged from the simulated recall data was um, the amount of um, to the, the extent to which more experienced students referred uh, to high level revising. Um, so they made comments like this, which um, suggest that um, they focused it, that although they spent a, both groups of participants spent a similar amount of time looking at their own work, um, it suggests that there was a difference in purpose. Um, for the more experienced students with them focusing on uh, things like cohesion and coherence when they were editing the Finally, if we look at the results for research question three, the differences between the low and high scoring participants, uh, we can see that in terms of distribution, what part of the screen they looked at, there was really no difference. But where a difference did emerge was in terms of their, um, the amount of time they spent fixating on the most relevant um, sections of sentences of the source text. We can see here that for the low scoring participants, they seem to be much less able to uh, distinguish which parts of the text are relevant um, to their answer. So we can see the difference there in the Pearson's correlation uh, figures. And um, we can see as well that um, that difference in the patterns of reading, the amount of selective reading and careful reading. Again, the difference between the high and low scoring participants um, emerges there with um, high, the, the high scoring participants engaging in greater amounts of selective reading. And when we looked at the stimulated recall um, data uh, for differences between the high and the low scoring um, participants, we can see that um, the high scoring participants um, mentioned using task instructions to guide their selection of information and materials from the texts. Um, none of the low scoring participants mentioned this. Um, high scoring participants also reported um, creating a macro plan that guided their search and selection of information from the tests. They also, um, there were differences between the way they edited their work. While both groups have spent the same amount of time looking at their work, high scorers made uh, more comments about high level revisions, um, whilst the lower scoring participants seem to be focusing um, their remarks on things like paraphrasing, much lower level revisions. Okay, so I'm sorry, I know I've given you an awful lot of information very quickly. Um, so let's just summarize those key findings. Um, a clear approach, a clear task rep representation and early planning um, seem to influence the way that participants read 
Selective reading skills, such as skimming, scanning and searching, accounted for 70% of the, the, the reading on the written source tests, with careful reading um, uh, accounting for um, uh, the, the remaining 30%. More experienced writers um, focused more on high level revisions and identifying the most relevant parts of the text seemed to be critical to task achievements. And that was something that the low scoring participants were unable to do. So to conclude, um, there seem to be um, two uh, uh, different ends of the spectrum, where at one end of the spectrum, we had the macro planners, the most competent um, participants, and they seem to have a well-developed macro plan, which they use. They created that plan right at the outset after reading the uh, assignment brief, and they use that plan to help the guide their reading and select their ideas from the text. So they went through, if you like, cherry picking the ideas that they needed from the text and slotting them in to their macro plan as they went. Um, they only added flesh to the bones for the most relevant points, um, not bothering to take notes about the less relevant um, information in the text. And when they edited, they focused on high level revisions. At the other end of the spectrum, we had what I call text responders. They started by reading all of the text, uh, all of the ideas in both texts. Um, they made notes on everything in order of appearance. Um, and they may have um, fleshed out points which were not necessarily relevant to the assignment brief. So now before they um, can uh, produce their final product, they now need to redraft or rearrange those notes, perhaps now realising that some of the information they've made notes on was irrelevant and deleting it and reorganising the order of it. And um, when they were editing, um, they seem to be focused on lower level revisions. So uh, what are the implications for uh, teaching and testing? My research, I think, suggests that students may need practice to develop clear task representations. Obviously, those need to be um, situated in the wider expectations of that academic field. Um, and they may also need not only uh, practice developing those task representations, but practicing how to translate those uh, representations into reading and writing goals. Planning for academic writing also involves setting reading goals, and these can help um, students assess relevance and make connections between texts. So um, this is more likely um, to lead to knowledge transformation rather than them just retelling this knowledge telling, um, rather than just reporting what they've read, but making managing to, to generate new ideas and connections based on their reading. Meeting their reading goals relies on them using selective reading skills, such as GIST and search reading and scanning, in a really targeted and purposeful way. And if we were to include tasks aimed at selective reading skills, focus on those in academic English tests and in EAP courses, um, it's my belief that that would have a positive washback in terms of students' preparedness um, to engage in academic reading and to writing tasks. And of course, we need to um, talk about the limitations of this study. So the task was very short compared to most um, coursework assignments, and um, it may not have elicited the full range of cognitive processes. The reading texts were pre-selected, which doesn't represent real world circumstances, and the balances of types of reading may change. But I would suggest that if students have to find their own tasks, that they would need to use even more selective uh, reading. The task may not have stretched participants sufficiently, so the scores on the task were quite homogeneous um, uh, for the participants. And there were, of course, a limited number of participants, only 30 participants. Um, 
eye tracking data is difficult and very time consuming to collect. And of course, eye movements can only suggest cognitive processes. And there is no uh, guarantee that those eye movements are representative of reading. Um, we can only infer uh, reading processes from eye movements. And finally, uh, here are my references.